Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the LaRouge Rugby Podcast. My name is Dan Murphy, and with me always is Derek Brissett and Stu Hardy. Gentlemen, we have uh, we have another guest from down south, uh, from the uh, the Lone Star State, Mr. Jeff Hassler. You know, former CLC Wolf, former Osprey, and one of the members of Canada's uh, national rugby team. Jeff, uh, thanks for coming on, uh, coming on to the show and uh, joining us. No, thanks a lot for having me, boys. I'm um, I'm pretty excited to to have a few conversations with you. Yeah, we got lots of questions because you know you've had such a interesting and amazing career in rugby, and you know it, it's still going strong. So. Uh, let's get right into it. And uh, <laughs> 2020 and so far 2021 has been an absolute mess for for rugby players. So during your time off, which seems been going on almost to a year, what have you been up to during COVID nineteen? Um, yeah, honestly, um, things kind of uh, came hot and fast, especially being in Seattle. I think that was like the, the first official. Um, hot zone of North America. And um, we found out, I think, I remember the day, and I don't think anyone's going to really forget that, but after the NBA shut down on like the uh, March 15th, I think our owner came onto the pitch during a training session and said, boys, you gotta, you gotta get home. Um, And borders were being talked about being closed and it was pretty much throw everything in your bag and drive back uh, across the border. And at that point, uh, there's so many uncertainties, but um, I, uh, at that point, had um, just got in, uh, voted on to the Rugby Canada Board of Directors as the, the player representative. So kind of just put a lot of my time and effort into that um, and then spent the, the first three months trying to get a, a Rugby Canada Players Association off the, off the ground, actually, um, and uh, Happy to say that that has now happened, uh, and we've got a pretty good working group of, um, of players from all four of the the Rugby Canada programs. So um, that was a that was a huge thing that I, I did put a lot of time and, and effort into, and then also kind of um, just getting myself prepared for transition uh, within life. So um, doing a real estate brokerage license uh, and. Uh, yeah, just uh, just ticking away, trying to trying to get things uh, in line for when when the, the time finally does come when I hang the boots up. Could you uh, go into a little bit more detail about what the uh, Rugby Canada Players Association is uh, is all about? Hundred um, percent. It's something that's been talked about for years. Um, you know, like I've been I've been around the. Rugby Canada program for for quite a long time, and I think I've heard rumors and stuff since 2013, um, and it was something that I had the time to do, so I really put a lot of energy into it. And uh, basically, it was um, what what we wanted to do, or what I wanted to do, and the the vision of it is just to get all four programs aligned, get a collective bargaining agreement in place, um, have um, a platform where all the players are supported on and off the field and uh, that's something that we just didn't have before so um, now that we're officially up and running we've got uh, multiple committees within um, within the PA and a lot of it's based around kind of wellness um, you know having mental health support having um, you know performance guys there that people can tap into whenever they need to do um, and and just getting those resources that that rugby Canada players don't generally have um, Again, it's like rugby is not a, a massive sport. It's not a hockey. It's not something like that where we've got all those things that people can really um, rely heavily on. But it's something that we're, we, we feel is super important, and I personally do as well. Um, so getting that up and running, uh, it, again, it's a challenge, figuring out the best way to do it um, and, uh, and just giving players that kind of platform. So we're still kind of in the early days of it, but... Um, I think we've done a pretty good job so far and hopefully it's just going to grow and, and give our players something that they can really use um, again on and off the field. Yeah. And like what kind of things are you guys as like the rugby can athletes then like what would be like looking for into like a collective bargaining agreement with, uh, with rugby Canada? Um, so when we actually like dive into it, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. You look at like CFL stuff and i uh, worked quite closely with um, the USA uh, they got theirs um, up and running in about 27, 2018. And again, 
three years, four years into it, they're still adopting new things, but it's, it's having um, kind of proper streamlined stuff for guys that are transitioning out of rugby, which is a huge thing. Um, I think we've identified that as one of the, the biggest things that guys that have put in, you know, 10, 12 years into, into a rugby career, um, when, when they're ready to go into the real world and, and that sort of thing, it, it, it is a bit of a, a culture shock, you know, and it's, it's thinking I'm not going to be playing for Rugby Canada anymore. And um, I've got to kind of set myself up and my family, some boys have kids, that, that sort of stuff. So having um, a real streamlined kind of transition program, having um, uh, mentorships and, and that sort of thing and guys that have interests in whatever they're, they're doing, that's really what we want to set up. Like, can we give them kind of, um, taster sessions on whatever career it is, if it's firefighting yeah. or, you know, give them life skills, help with education. Most of what we're doing is for me, it's, it's setting guys up, um, w with things that aren't rugby related. And that's most of the feedback that we've had from, from everybody within rugby Canada across all four of the, of the programs. It's, <clears throat> how do we transition? Uh, so that's where a lot of our focus is. And then obviously being, um, an Olympic year uh, with World Cup qualifications too. This is a massive, massive year for, for Rugby Canada. So it's, um, can we put people in place that um, can help with mental coaching? Um, the stresses of COVID-19 have been um, super, super high for, for most players. And how do, we, how do we navigate those kind of waters, right? So can we put people in place that if, if you just need to speak to someone about anything, um, your current life situation, uh, again, the transition and, and what the actual um, Tokyo situation looks like, right? So it, it, it's all that and there's, there's so much within it, but yeah, we just want to give people um, that sort of kind of background help more or less in a, in a short way of putting it. And it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned the kind of those next steps of your career post rugby, because before Christmas, we had a DTH Vandermerver on and, that was one of the things when we were talking about, he's talking about the future of rugby. He mentioned Ben Lesage and his degree. And he said how important it is to set yourself up for the future after rugby. Cause you know, with the, the wages in rugby just aren't like you mentioned, aren't like hockey. They're not like, you know, American football. It's, it's a very different atmosphere. So to set yourself up for success later on. So it's fantastic that you guys are working towards helping your fellow athletes, especially in, in Canada. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's super important. And I think it's something that if you, I, me, me personally as well, like being over uh, in different areas and different um, uh, associations, the Welsh Rugby Players Association was very well um, set up, but we just didn't have that. Um, and putting out like an initial just survey, like, is this worth my time doing? Like 90% of the athletes said, yeah, 100%. We need it. We want it. And um, they're looking at what kind of benefits they can get from it. And it was all related about post two years um, of, of your rugby career. And, you know, we've got lots of players that have great platforms and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're in that kind of period where they're just wondering what's next. And that is, to me, it's a massive, massive thing that there's a bit of a gap right now with uh, rugby in Canada. And it's something that we're trying to close. Now, with the uh, evolution of Major League Rugby, was this something that kind of helped spur the, the movement of trying to get this, this union together? Um, yeah, I think Major League Rugby has been um, a super, super good uh, tool for, for rugby. Can learn the fact that guys are playing all the time. Um, and then also it's a six-month uh, season or six, seven-month season. Um, and guys can really get both of those things. They can get into proper rugby, uh, whether you're a young guy that's trying to uh, break into the rugby Canada squad or, or, or whatever. And then having the six months to align um, schooling or, uh, you know, work or whatever you need to do. It's just, it's, it's, it's a really good kind of platform. So I think having, I think yesterday I heard from Kingsley, there's 54 players playing in the MLR, which is for us as a, as a country, it's a, it's a massive, massive thing. Right. Um, and I think because you can do six months of high level rugby and then six months of being back at home, wherever your home base, um, and trying to put those, um, those kind of pillars in, in, 
into your life. It's, it's a massive benefit across the board. Yeah. And you correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but you also have recently put in the plans to open up a gym in Langford. Is that, is that something that you've uh, always wanted to do as a bit of a post rugby career? Um, yeah. Um, honestly, no, uh, it wasn't something that I was, uh, specifically looking at, but, um, I kind of jump on opportunities when they, when they present themselves to me. Um, and it's been a pretty wild experience so far. Um, you know, dealing with a, a massive franchise that have um, kind of all their checks in place and, you know, learning what that kind of um, environment's like. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's something that's come through the MLR process. So um, there, there are tons of opportunities for guys, whether it's me being in, uh, in this um, gym industry or whatever, but you, you can kind of aim your efforts and um, your time into something that you really want to do. And um, again, since COVID broke out, that's something that I've been able to kind of throw myself fully into as well. So it really gives that, that opportunity for players to do, uh, do those things and, and direct their attention and time into, into the things they really enjoy. So we'll shift focus back to uh, back to some on pitch stuff. And one of the questions we kind of ask all our guests that do come on um, just because it's kind of interesting, you know, being in Canada, being within the, the rugby community, because everyone seems to have a really different answer. Um, but how exactly did you become involved in rugby? Because, you know, uh, you were kind of breaking into like some of the U17 teams and stuff like that. At the same time, you were playing football for the Saskatchewan Huskies as well. So like, how did your uh, rugby journey start? Um, uh, yeah, and it's, um, I love, uh, I love talking to people about it because it's just rugby is such a, in my, in my mind, um, uh, a minor sport in Canada, obviously you've got, uh, the big drivers. And for me growing up, um, football was a, a huge thing. Um, but during the off seasons in, in high school, I suppose, um, we had, um, at my, my high school in Okotoks, there was a, a British guy and uh, just a diehard, diehard um, rugby fan. And um, he basically looked at, I think it was my um, grade 10 year. Um, and from that, there were about seven or eight guys that were going to go on and play um, university football. So pretty athletic group of guys, uh, big physical that sort of thing. And he just said, well, you guys have a huge off season. So instead of just running track and field, do you guys want to set up this rugby team? And I had no idea what rugby was like, not even a singular rule about rugby. And uh, he just said, it doesn't matter, man, you guys are big, big, strong, fast. Um, and you basically just go pass the ball and hit people. And uh, we all kind of just signed up blindly. And uh, within that first year, I didn't know a single rule. Uh, I remember uh, being on the on the field and uh, not really knowing anything that's going on, but loved loved the aspect of it, um, and then did that from I guess yeah seventeen on, and ended up getting into the Alberta stream and then um, age grade Canada stuff, uh, and just kind of going from there. Um, but I would uh, I put a lot of well most of um, the kind of inspiration behind it was uh, behind the guy, Joe Buck, who um, was pretty um, inspirational in starting rugby in Alberta and had, um, you know, kind of ground root stuff with our age grade and uh, U14, U16 created all the programs um, with the Foothills Lions. And uh, yeah, he was just a, an awesome guy and it more or less was the springboard for, for rugby for me. Well, another uh, question that we'd like to ask all of our guests is because obviously you're a Canadian international and you've also played with some big names on the pitch, but who's someone that you've loved to watch every time they like lace up their boots, every time they're on, you're cheering them on and want to see how they do? Um. Yeah, I mean, I've fortunately had um, a uh, a good opportunity to see some of what I think are the best rugby players in the world and play alongside them. But honestly, one one of the guys that I just love 
um, as a person, as a rugby player, and, and the way he goes about it is um, is Justin Dibrick. He's just an absolute animal. Um, he he could play ten if you need to throw him into that position. <laughs> yeah. like, he's so skilled. Like I mean, I I played I played wing in that team for five seasons, and the guy is more skilled than ninety percent of the people on the pitch. And his his rugby IQ is through the roof. And he's just also one of the nicest people you'll ever see. Like he's a kind of a one club guy. Um, you know, he's, he's had opportunities to go all over France and this and that, and to, to make like genuine, good, good cash. I'm not saying he's not making good cash now, but um, he just is, he's a Trebanos boy, which is just up the road from Swansea. And um, he's just like the, yeah, the way he plays and, and the skill level and, he's just so fun to watch. You don't know what he's going to pull out of the bag. Um, and it's always in big moments too. And, uh, and he does it without wanting anything in return, just puts his body on the line and uh, is a, just a genuine, awesome guy and a great player. So I love watching him. Um, anytime I see him suiting up in six nations and stuff like that, um, really, really enjoy watching the way the guy plays. Now, is that your, your team that you cheer for? Like six nations comes on. Are you, are you a Wales guy or, do you not try not to show affiliation? You just enjoy watching rugby. Um, honestly, like, yeah, I, I, I've been there for so long, and I've got a, a real attachment to those guys. And even still, like, um, I talk to all of them all the time. Um, and if I ever travel to Europe and stuff like that, I'll, I'll make sure I stop back in Wales. But um, I, I'll, I'll, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll fly my Welsh flag for those guys. But um, uh, at the same time, I like to see uh, I like to see good competition. And like uh, before the World Cup, we put it like a huge rugby pool in with some of the boys, and I thought it was going to be England. So uh, I wasn't like fully backing my my Welsh buddies, but uh, you know, like I, I'm looking at all <laughs> the games and stuff, and I'd love to see them do well. But uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm I'm fully in their in their corner all the time. But I'm individually, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm backing players to to have good. Um, good tournaments and that sort of thing. It's, it's tough to uh, pull for Wales at the world cup when they always have to play Fiji and Australia. Yeah. They're always stuck in the same pool together. So it's like, it, it, it's tough to always kind of vote for them. 100% man. And that was a crazy world cup pool. Again, they get the exact same people. Yeah. <laughs> the exact, uh, they're probably sitting there going, not again. Right. Cause that's groundhog kind of- day all over again. <laughs> When it when it got drawn, I was like, "Oh my goodness!" Like, and it's a tough pool because you've got, you know, the two kind of mainstay um, teams, which um, you know are going to probably go deep in the competition. But then you throw in like a Fiji, who over the last I'd say five years are really really developing, and they've got absolute animals of players, and those guys can tip anyone at any point. So it's like a total crapshoot, basically, of, of what that's going to be, right? For sure. <laughs> Uruguay threw a pretty big wrench into that pool this year too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, yeah, there's, they're another beast themselves. Like they're, they're doing everything right as far as a tier two nation. So um, yeah, it, it's tough. So you've already mentioned Jeff, your, your overseas career. So we want to kind of uh, delve into that a little bit. And uh, our, our first question is, can you give us an idea of what the process is like for a Canadian to join an overseas team? And you joined them in 2013 what is that like? Like, you know, and, and hockey, we, we talk about hockey as in like a pathway and it's, it's very clear how the pathway works. So you, you play major junior, then you get drafted and you join that team. And you might make like, but, but rugby, especially when, when you started, it was a lot murkier. Like how did, how does that all, how did it all come to fruition for you? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, honestly, it's a really good question, and it doesn't really make sense. Um, <laughs> it, does, it doesn't, though. Like I've seen guys that are, in my opinion, way more skilled than I am. It's timing and placement of everything, right? Um, so I think, for me, I I was at University of Saskatchewan playing football, um, and then just really loved rugby in the sense of uh, what it was about and like the players and the culture and that sort of stuff. So that thing, that part of it was um, already 
in place for me. Um, and then uh, I think year after my second year there, it was after the 2011 World Cup. Um, and Karen Crowley was the, the, the men's 15 coach at the time. Uh, and Garrett John was the sevens coach. And they, they contacted me and said, hey, basically, we've got a big kind of turnover of players. Um, and you're on our kind of long list. Um, I think I was somewhere around Fernie when I got the call about being on the long list for the 2011 World Cup. And I, at that point, I was only two years into my rugby career. And that's when I kind of started thinking this might be a genuine thing. Um, and I ended up uh, leaving University of Saskatchewan two years into my football career. And at, at that point in my life, I thought CFL was the, the thing that I really wanted to, to kind of go for. Um, and then that opportunity came up. So I, I moved over there, um, not knowing a single person, uh, not knowing what I was going to do schooling wise, transferring um, to UVic and that sort of thing. Um, and then just being in that sevens environment and full time rugby training. Uh, and just as a, I think I was 19 years old, like just totally loving it. And then next thing you know, you're on the seven circuit going around the world playing with 11 of your best buddies. Um, and I, I never really looked at, at rugby as a, as a job or profession type thing. It was more, um, the opportunities that it was giving me to go to different places and, um, to, to experience different cultures and, and that sort of thing. Right. And then for me, it was just a bit of luck of the draw. Uh, I think 2012, 2013 was, um, when I first got into the Canada squad, um, for both sevens and fifteens. Um, and it, yeah, I get, it was lucky because I think, I think Ospreys were actually looking at Tyler Ardron. Um, and I just happened to kind of fall into, a starting spot in that one game with an injury. I was on the bench and then got pulled in. Um, and we just, there were, they're the right people there watching at the right time. And then for their program, uh, they had changes in uh, the higher staff and stuff. So they were kind of looking at young players that they could bring in on the cheap, I guess I would say. <laughs> um, so all of those things really have to kind of line up. Um, and then also your, your, your personal, um, I don't know, just when, when you get there, there's lots of guys that have come over and maybe done a year and then come back and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's just the, the situation that you're brought into and then how you kind of have to adapt to it and jump full feet into it. Um, I was just, I was again, super lucky um, to, to be brought into a team that A was willing to use their foreign spots on a Canadian, um, which is the biggest thing. Like, again, said there's there's tons of guys that have have the skill to do it but when you are competing against new zealanders and south africans and that sort of thing and in the european environment you only have two players that can play week in week out and for five seasons it was me and ty it, like super super crazy that we're the two ones that are filling their position but we just came in at an opportune time and we're young able to adapt to that environment and just got along with a, the coaches and the players and were able to kind of get ourselves into that environment and, and make ourselves um, um, part of that team. Um, but again, it's tough. It, it is really tough. And um, yeah, I, I wish that kind of thing would change a little bit um, to give guys better opportunities to go over because we have the players here in Canada and if we were able to really kind of tap into that, our rugby program across the board would, would be in a much better position. But unfortunately, you guys just don't get the opportunity to do it. And teams aren't willing to, um, to put their investment on the line when they're looking at guys that have just kind of maybe fallen through the cracks of wallabies and, and that sort of thing. Right. Right. Uh, from tier one nations. Um, so it is. It's just a stroke of luck, to be honest. I'm not going to sit here and say like I'm uh, better than any other player in Canada. There, there are guys that deserve it, and there are guys that miss out. And it's just, it is timing and opportunity at that at that moment. Now, um, you mentioned that like the CFL was something that that you you thought was going to be your future. Do you ever look back and be like, 
if I stuck with football, maybe I, you know, I could have played for the Rough Riders or the Stampeders or, or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, like I said, going back to, to high school, we had a really solid group of players. Um, one of which is um, Charlie Power. He's one of my, my, my best friends and went to high school together. And he um, has been part of the Calgary Stampeders for like eight seasons as a, a local homegrown kind of guy. And I think now he's one of the oldest guys on the team. He's been there for so long. And I, mean, I talk to him all the time. And there was actually a stint where I think it was after my um, 2017 season. I was like, I'm 27 right now. And like, I, I missed football. And I actually was like, is there a chance that I can jump back on and try and try and do like a little thing with the Stampeders? And he's like, I'll, I'll talk to Huff right now. He's like, let's go. <laughs> you know, like, um, I, football is a great sport. And like I said, I, I chose rugby um, for different reasons, but 100%, like it's always been in the back of my head. Um, I love the game. I, I'm in like six fantasy football leagues and, you know, <laughs> just I, I love it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's always something that's been in the back of my head. But once you get into – playing professional rugby and um, living that kind of life. And slowly those things kind of move away. Um, you think of the memories you had pretty fondly, but um, yeah, once you, once you're living in a different country and able to jump on like a train or a plane for 15 quid to go to Italy or something, like yeah. it, it changes your, your scope of, uh, of things like pretty drastically. So um, yeah, to answer your question, i I think about football all the time. Um, and the people that were part of that program and, uh, and my, my friends that are involved, um, I, I watch them still. Uh, I wouldn't say I'd, Rough Riders would be my, uh, my go-to. <laughs> uh, yeah. Making that university connection, you know? Yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah, exactly. Like being, being in Saskatoon, it was funny because I said, boys, that's the last place I'd want to be is Regina, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they're a good team. So so talking about the connection with uh, having friends in high places and having that camaraderie that you've mentioned, and you mentioned before that you believe the Ospreys were looking for Tyler Ardron, and then you were in their peripheral and both of you went to the Ospreys. Did having Tyler there in that professional environment um, really help your development as a player for like the club side as well? Just having another Canadian so you weren't just the lone Canuck in the Ospreys a hundred percent funny enough like back in I think it was my first season ever playing rugby uh, I think that was the under 17 tour um, Ty was on that team as well so we came through the system um, at the exact same time and we instantly bonded he was at McMaster University um, at that point I was playing football too so I was kind of doing the, the, the cross thing, cross sport thing. He was a, a volleyball guy. Um, so both of us, we'd had conversations really, really early in our lives about um, kind of the pathways of, of rugby and if it was something that we both wanted to do. So I remember um, we were both on the seventh circuit at that time. And um, the, the agent we ended up linking up with met us at the end of uh, the seven series in 2013 and sat down with both of us um, and said, there's a quite a bit of interest over here. Um, what, what, what are you guys thinking? Uh, and, and at that point there were a few pro D teams and um, that was something that I, I genuinely was interested in going and um, not a French speaking guy, but I, I, that was something that was really appealing to me, but then also then Ospreys came in, um, and looking at both of us and he actually, he, uh, had said, well, I said to him, if I'm going to go do this, I want to do it at the highest level. So that's why I ended up picking Ospreys, um, to go there instead of Prodida. Um, but then he was like, okay, well, you're going to go there. Um, I've got an offer from Newcastle and he I played it exactly that, the way you would want to try to do. And he leveraged it <laughs> and that was a whole different thing, but having him end up coming over um, to Ospreys with me was just it, so, so much nicer. Um, you know, like being in a place with new people, um, 
different. I remember day one of walking into the, the clubhouse. I couldn't understand what these guys were saying. <laughs> and they were speaking English. And I was like, you just need to slow down. Like, you know, I'm like 19 years old and I couldn't understand my own teammates. I'm like, you guys just need to. <laughs> and I'd say that to him. I'd be like, I didn't hear a word you said. And they, just, <laughs> they would just laugh. But so having him there the whole time for the I, this was four, the first four years we played together. It was super nice because when we'd go back home, it was like we're back in Canada. We'd play NHL on the PlayStation, like just little things like that. It's so, so overlooked how much those things really mean. And then we can relate to each other from where we've come from, from um, being in that environment. If you're there by yourself, it's tough, right? Where we can just go debrief in like the most low key kind of environment like there no one's judging or whatever you can just talk about any, anything and having another guy that's come to the exact same system at the same time same age different universities but like you're going through the same experience at the same time that was huge like on a massive and um it was also funny because the the other welsh guys just they called us the canadians and they're like these guys are just on an absolute jolly right now like coming over here they're like you're taking our money you're you're having you're having a great time and it and we could we could we could just yeah our our house was just like a we had canadian paraphernalia everywhere like 100 percent people you leaned into it you leaned into the stereotype 100 percent, yeah 100 <laughs> percent. and so it really did help um and I, th I don't think my experience would have been the same without having someone else there so like it it was just a again opportune that both of us same club um, again, because we were going through that kind of recruitment period together, we made the decision to go to the same club together. Like he could have gone somewhere else, but um, we stuck together. And I think if you look at his career now too, it's just, it was the kind of springboard to where he is um, and, and myself as well. And it was just a, a very, very um, fun experience to, to be with one of your best buddies and uh, I'd say to this point, he's, he's my best friend. Um, we spent a lot of time going through those um, early struggles of, of pro rugby in a different country and traveling and all, all the things that come with it. So hundred percent, I think we were at an advantage having that for sure. So kind of coming back to North America now, then you joined the Seattle Sea Wolves uh, partway through, I guess, three quarters of the way through the 2019 season. Um, what was it like kind of joining a team um, toward the end of the year? And then obviously, you know, scoring a couple tries and contributing to their, their championship run toward the end of the season there. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, I'll put a, put a plug in for Phil Mack. Um, the guy is just an absolute beauty. Love, love him. Um, he just knew as well, and he's having a great time with that. But um, he, um, I, he was one of the first guys I met when I first moved over to Victoria, um, and we just got along like straight away. He's a bit older than me, and um, just loved loved everything that he was about. So super, super passionate about it. Um, but so just before I get into that, like 2018 um, had an extra year with Ospreys and just decided I needed a bit of a break. So at that point I had gone down to, and I might be skipping um, through some of the stuff and again, bring me back, but um, yeah, in my brain, that's kind of how it works for me. So um, <laughs> I was on a yacht in South Africa and Phil messages me and he goes, Hey, we're in fifth place right now. Um, in the MLR and we've had a couple wing injuries he goes I know you're loving what you're doing and you said you're going to hang the boots up but he's like I've got one more kick at this can and we're in a position where we can go for a playoff push and hopefully go back to back in the MLR um, and I remember man I was sitting on a yacht in the middle of the ocean <laughs> and I was like I was like I'm loving this right now to be honest with you but, <laughs> um, and then he goes well He's like, come back, help us win this thing, do a World Cup with me, and let's retire together. Like, we'll go into the sail into the sunset, you know. Um, and that, like, in my head, I was like, man, 2015 World Cup was great. I was like, Japan's going to be, I knew Japan was going to be a pretty awesome experience. So that kind of sparked to that. Um, 
and then I was doing beach runs and my knee was inflamed and like all sorts. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm get, getting back into here, but jumped into the MLR situation um, in full swing of their season, not knowing any of the players or anything. And half the guys are like, who, who is this dude? He's like, hasn't played rugby for eight months. Uh, like just, it was wild. It was wild, but really enjoyed my experience there. And um, again, a lot of credit due to, to Phil to, to try to get that in place. And um, I'm sitting here now in, in Texas and um, still playing. So again, a lot of credit to that guy. And uh, it MLR was a great experience for me and it kind of re reinvigorated rugby. So um, yeah. What was like the next couple of days after winning the shield like? Uh, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I was wearing this exact shirt. Oh. I don't know if you boys can see, but I'm in a full romper. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, man, it was awesome. We were in San Diego. Such such a fun city, um, and it's just you know it, I I've never been in um, in a position to win anything. So we were a very competitive um, team in high school football and basketball. Like I played all the different sports, and we were always within that kind of like top ten percent. But I never kind of got there. Um, and then joining in. Um, I told the boys, I was like, this is a, this is the first final I've ever been a part of. And like, lots of guys were like, no, that's crazy. And I was like, in any level, any league, any sport, this is the first one. I was like, we got to win this thing. Um, and it was super fun, man. Like new for a new, new club, new program, um, new league, all that sort of stuff. Um, you're kind of trailblazing. So no one else has done it. So you got that little edge in the fact that you're like these no, no one else in this league knows what it's like um and of course we did all the sorts of stuff you'd expect with a champion <laughs> especially in san diego yeah. like yeah. yeah i've got to say as an ospreys fan when um i read the press release of you joining austin and you said that uh, the mlr shield was your first final it's kind of like when someone tells you the nineties wasn't 10 years ago, I have to like go back through like the history yeah. of the Os and that hurt as an Oscar race fan, just realizing that the last time they lifted any final um, silverware was back in 2012. Yeah. Um, the, year, the year before I came, they like, I, they're a super successful club, but like, I, I think I went to two semifinals in my five years there. Yeah. So got this close. We oh actually, yeah! Oh no! I I watched it. Yeah. It hurts every time going back and seeing how like a knock on had uh, prevented a try and uh, no. I can live that so vividly. Honestly, like I remember that moment. I remember Josh Madavesi touching the ball down and then having Nigel pull us back and we lose the game after we celebrated with the win. Like I know. It, 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 I've been that close so many times. Yeah. Um, so to go. Um, it finished my rugby career in my brain Yeah, off a boat, join up with the team that's there has won it before get into that culture, have the opportunity and then to win it. It was, I mean, it was super fun. Um, my family's super close. I've got three brothers um, and the timelines of it um, overlapped with my old man's birthday and we flew him down. He was on like the little lime scooters ripping around San Diego and he was there <laughs> for the thing. Like, super cool. Uh, and he was stoked, came out with the boys after like that whole night out yeah. having, having drinks with the boys. And like, he's followed my career, obviously very closely. He knows yeah. more about rugby than I do. And so to have him there as well. And like, he just goes, man, you're, I think at that point I was 27. He's like, how's it feel to finally be a champion? I was like, man, it's so good. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> like so fun. Like it was awesome. Um, so talking about big occasions as well, obviously lifting your first championship. Um, with something that you could celebrate with your family, um, something that you probably also was able to celebrate with your family um, was your first cap. And that you've been with the uh, Canada squad for um, seven years, I believe at this point, but your first test was in 2012. 
can you describe the feelings of being able to be called up and then starting your first match in uh, the red jersey for Canada? Um, yeah, so that, that first year, I think it was, you know, 2012. Yeah, 2012. Um, my first, my first tour with the guys was, um, a June tour and it was in Canada, which is really nice. You kind of know the June tour is always going to be a home based and then November tour typically is over in the UK or France or whatever. Um, so my first one was, um, in Ontario. Um, and I came off the bench in that game, but I actually, I had mono at first tour and wow. it wasn't, uh, it, it, I was like, in, I, I felt like I was dying. I was like dire straits. And I'm like, I can't be that young guy that comes in and doesn't train the entire time. And I was like, absolute soaking my bed with sweat, like dying. Uh, and I was like, I just got to grind on. I was like, yeah, we're in a national team environment. And at that time too, like Crowley ran a very, very tight ship. And it was like, it, it was, a as a young guy that hadn't played a lot of rugby in a very intense environment. Um, so in my head, I'm like, I just got to keep grinding through and then find out later that I was like super ill and shouldn't have been playing any rugby with like, <laughs> all that sort of stuff, but yeah, you're what, what, 18, 19, like yeah. that's, that's, that's typical thought process. hundred percent. And I, I remember like DTH was sitting there, like he was the, the guy like in my position and had done it. And he was looking at me and he's just like, you gotta, you gotta suck it up. Like, and I was like, oh, something's not right here. Like I'm, I'm not feeling well. <laughs> <And> he's, <laughs> he's like, he's like, no, like it's just, you gotta do it. Um, so that, that first, that first tour, I think, um, I sat on the bench, we played Italy at BMO, um, and just narrowly lost to them. And just even being along for that ride, I, I did get my first cap against the USA, um, 20 minutes off the bench, but that was more of like a learning process, um, for me getting comfortable with the systems and, and all that stuff. And at that point, I, I still kind of thought of myself as a, as a, as a football player that was playing rugby. So I hadn't fully converted in, in my brain. Right. Um, and then I think it was, it was the next tour in November that really, um, yeah, that was when things kind of changed for me mentally. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to jump into this full swing. Um, and I remember we were in Colwyn Bay, North Wales. And again, that kind of comes back to when the, the Ospreys guys were scouting Ty. Um, I, I piggybacked off that big time, but, um, Sean Duke was the, the starting winger that game. Um, and he had uh, a hamstring issue. And I remember Crowley came to me, uh, and said, uh, we're going to throw you in there. Like the night before the game, he's like, you're going to go come off the bench and you're going to start. Um, and we were playing Russia the next day. And, um, that to me is still like, you always are going to remember your, your first rugby game, um, your first start and that sort of thing. Um, but that was a, that was a massive moment for me. Um, and still one of, it's my, one of my favorite games to go back on. I had, I had a solid game that, that game, which again, the timing and the luck of it, having the Ospreys coaches watching that game in Colin Bay, um, I think, was massive and then because it was my first start my old man's got this um he doesn't want to miss out on stuff and he flew out that day as soon as oh, i called wow. him and said yeah he flew from canada straight over and i remember walking we we're in like this crazy old like country welsh manor in the middle of absolute nowhere and then he walked through like this like tiny kind of overarching um rock wall and i saw him and i was like what the hell's going on <laughs> he's like well, it's your first canada start he's like i'm here for it and that like so sick um so it was a huge game for me not only playing wise but career wise all those kind of things lined up and having uh my family member there as well um that was that was huge but uh yeah just again opportunities at that at the right time uh, but that that first start was 
that was pretty much everything that springboarded my entire career. So we're, we're going to start wrapping this up, Jeff. Uh, you've been, you've been great with answering some of our questions. So we've got a few more, but um, whatever 2021 is going to look like you are starting uh, your, your career again in, in a new, new club, a new city, uh, starting with, with uh, the Austin Guild Gronies. What are you excited about with, with the city and the club? Because the Gilgronies really kind of added a lot of really different uh, pieces to their, to their club this year. And, you know, Austin's, uh, you know, unofficial uh, motto is keep Austin weird. So what, what gets you fired up for this season and, and just being down in Texas? Um, well, kind of the, the, there were, there were a few factors that really came into effect for, for me to come down here. One of which was two of my brothers have been living in Houston for, uh, multiple years. So that was a, a huge thing. Um, and kind of why I, um, sought Austin out from being in Seattle. Um, but then also I remember, um, I was, I was on one of the the Vancouver islands on a camping trip, like doing nothing and spoke to Sam Harris, the, the new head coach. Um, and he, he really kind of fired me up. He was a player himself. Obviously the coaching staff here are young. They're young enough to really relate to all of the players. They're, they're coming over from Australia and he's coached in, in Japan and, everything he said to me uh, just kind of really resonated. And it's funny you say like Austin's weird type thing. Um, but I was like, that's what I'm all about. Like, I want to, I want to come to a place that you can, you know, have a really enjoyable experience and everything that they said, they're building a team around um, just good people and guys that have ambitions on and off the field. And, um, my experiences so far with them has been like fantastic. Every two weeks we do zoom calls with the entire team. Guys are putting PowerPoint presentations um, onto the zoom call and doing more or less what we're doing. how did you get into rugby? Who are your inspirations? Um, tell us about your family. So when I got here a week and a half ago, I knew everybody by name, you know, like they created that environment and that is just, it, it goes so far for me being uh, playing for so many different teams in different areas and that sort of thing. Um, and I've been here for now almost two weeks and it's just been super fun and almost seamless because you know, the guys already, um, we got guys from all over the world. Um, but they're just letting, letting boys be who they are, um, uh, and then building the culture around that. They're, they're all about, uh, allowing you to, I guess the, the Austin thing is fly your freak flag in whatever way you want to do it. Right. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, we've got tons of great personalities and weird dudes and good dude. Uh, it, so far, my experience is really good, but the, the draw was exactly that. It was come here, be a part of this thing, um, get to know your, your teammates inside and out, even before we strap on boots. And, uh, and I really, I really did enjoy that. Um, just hearing some of the stories, we got a very, very diverse group, but um, the, the coaching staff and the ownership here, it's just really exciting because they're, um, talking to even some of the boys, they're like, we didn't win a game for the first two years. Right. And then they won the first game and like half the team was in tears. Like we've been grinding at this for so long. And I think this year you're going to see a completely different, um, Austin team. I think we're going to challenge some teams and we're going to, we're going to turn some heads because we've got we've got a good solid team. And I think it, it goes down to, again, the new ownership and, uh, and the coaching staff that are just building something that's um, it's the off field stuff. And that's how you see results. Right. And yeah. for me, having made the decision in 2018 that I was more or less thinking I'm done with rugby to, to be involved in a program that um, are doing those sorts of things. It's super exciting. Uh, and I think they're giving us the, the ability and the, and the pathway to, to make it a successful team. And everyone's really bought into that. So across the board, everyone's fired up about this season. I think AGs are going to be pretty solid. I'm looking forward to week one against the, the Seawolves. It's going to be fun. Um, and I think, honestly, we're going we're gonna to turn some heads for sure. 
you know, we're going to finish off with, with not rugby. We're going to finish off with a little bit of football. Because uh, when we when I first uh, contacted Jeff, he said, yeah, I'll come on the show. But got to make sure that we record before football because, you know, AFC, NFC play, uh, championships are today. So we're recording currently, you know, around uh, 10, 10 a.m. Uh, Ontario time. So, Jeff, I want to get your predictions for the games uh, later later today. You know, we've got uh, the the two old boys in the NFC with uh, the Packers and the Buccaneers. And in the AFC, we've got two uh, young powerhouse uh, uh, gunslingers with the, the Bills and the Chiefs. So who do you think is going to uh, make it to the Super Bowl this year? Yeah, first of all, I, w- I want to thank you guys, like, working around my my – love for football um <laughs> because of, 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 i was sat at the table yesterday again dates were and i was like are we doing this thing <laughs> <laughs> no it's tomorrow and i'm like oh my god like it's okay so ben fun. ben lesage uh, uh made sure that we uh record around the steelers uh kickoff because he's a big steelers fan yeah. and we all got a message like halfway through the game uh that he's just like well i wish the podcast had gone any longer because that was the game where they're playing the Browns in the playoffs. So we, we are very much used to uh, working around the football schedules. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I think I, my team is the Rams. So um, I followed them since I was as young as I can remember. Um, Marshall Falk was my guy um, as a, a young running back. And again, at that time, that was all I knew. I didn't even know what rugby was. Um, so I followed them through 17 years of absolute tragedy uh, <laughs> and uh, relocation and hundred percent. Yeah. And uh, just, it's, it's been, it's been tough for me, honestly. Um, but seeing them in the playoffs was great. Um, Packers, uh, in my opinion, much better team. Um, I'm at this point, I don't have a, a favorite in the, in the race anymore, I would say, but um, because Packers, beat my boys. Um, I'm going to back them uh, on that front. I think, um, yeah, I think they're a solid team in and out. Um, and I'll never bet against uh, Rogers and Devonte Adams. That, that combination is absolutely savage. Um, but then also I'd be an absolute hypocrite if I said that, um, that uh, Tom Brady was going to win. Uh, I got a couple of buddies, especially the Welsh boys. They, they, they love uh, North American sport over there. Um, but they're also just the biggest bandwagon jumpers. So <laughs> like they just like, I don't know, they look at the news or Instagram or whatever. And they're like, Oh, Tom Brady, he's the goat. He's the goat. And like, I will sit there and I'll respect the fact that the guy has done more than any other player, but I also would just love to see him lose. So, uh, just, oh. just for, for me and my social chats, it, it has to happen. <laughs> my my, I you know I grew up a Peyton Manning fan, and my little brother was a Tom Brady fan. So it was we were always coming to blows. So yeah. I will always cheer for Tom Brady to lose. Exactly. So I mean, I forty three years old, still doing what he does at the highest level. That's great, and I I don't want to see a guy go to like a new team after being um, at the Patriots for so long and and not be successful. But he's done enough, and I'm ready to I'm ready to see him get knocked off. <laughs> Okay, what about the AFC? Because it's a really interesting matchup, especially with Mahomes' injury. Um, yeah, that was something as well. Like a bunch of the boys have been talking about it, and I'm like, NFL is a, a different beast, and I know the guy's going to play. They're like, well, is he going to make it through concussion protocols? And I'm like, if you watch them, like as soon as he got hit, like you watch those things a little bit closer when you're actually involved in sport. And I was like, this guy, he's not in a good way. Like his knee – was like buckling he couldn't hold his what his self up but i was like he's gonna get pushed through this concussion protocol so fast um i would never bet against the chiefs i think overall they're um they're a better team um kelsey is just so fun to watch he's an animal um and if mahomes is able to to deliver even 60 percent, i think they've got it but i also really like the bills like the what they've done the last two years and josh adams is a good young player. I like the way he plays. So again, I think that side of it, the AFC, I'm, I'm not too concerned who wins. I think either team that goes through is going to give an absolute, um, a good, a good Super Bowl uh, effort. So um, man, I'm fired up. I'm ready for the game. 
Well, Jeff, we really do appreciate you uh, coming on the show today. Um, it's it's great. You know, we've had a couple arrows guys on, so we really appreciate you know some of the American based guys coming in. So thank you very much for for taking time out of your day and uh, and uh, just chatting down and talking some rugby with us. No, I appreciate it. And again, thank you, boys, for being flexible. <laughs> well, hopefully. You know, with all, all going well here in Canada, hopefully we'll be able to see you live in, uh, uh, in Toronto in, in May and uh, everything will just be smooth sailings. Yeah, well, um, again, look into it, boys. I think, uh, like I said, AGs are going to be um, going to be a pretty solid team. And I think uh, things are things are uh, going to turn around for, for the club and I'm super excited to be a part of it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fun year. And if anyone else is interested in listening to more of our episodes, you can find us on social media, La Rouge Rugby on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We post every time that we have uh, a podcast coming out. So thank you very much for listening, everyone, and uh, tune in for some more fantastic interviews.